Good morning, everybody, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues and uh, friends. On behalf of the Bulgarian Diplomatic Institute to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, I would like to welcome you to this uh, virtual discussion with uh, Mr. Uh, Clark Cooper, Assistant Secretary for Political and Military Affairs of the US uh, State Department. Uh, this event is uh, part of our uh, brand new initiative, uh, Global Virtual Auditorium Foreign Policy Series, um, in which we host and provide uh, a public uh, platform uh, for meaningful uh, discussion to foreign and Bulgarian ambassadors and high-ranking diplomats. Uh, for the event today, uh, just allow me to say a few words about the context of the event. In uh, 2019, the United States and uh, Bulgaria registered that uh, they have built strong and uh, lasting relationship uh, as uh, friends, um, uh, strategic partners and allies uh, who share um, uh, transatlantic commitments. Uh, as a result, as you all of you know, uh, an agreement was reached between the two countries uh, for closer uh, development uh, of strategic uh, cooperation in several areas, um, if you allow me just to remind that, in the field of security and defense, in the field of economy, trade and energy, in, um, and to strengthen democracy and the rule of law. Just uh, two weeks ago, the defense ministers of uh, Bulgaria and United States um, signed at the Pentagon a 10-year roadmap for defense cooperation between the two countries, Two days ago, uh, during the, the visit of uh, Mr. Clark Cooper, um, during the, his, his meeting with uh, our foreign minister, Mrs. Zakharyov, it was confirmed that uh, the partnership between the two countries, uh, Bulgaria and United States, should be developed not only at the bilateral level, but also within uh, NATO. Uh, they agreed that it was crucial for NATO to improve its presence in the Black Sea region. And I would like to mention that Mrs. Zakharyov uh, reaffirmed Bulgaria's proposal to establish the Maritime uh, Coordination Center in Varna to serve as the Alliance uh, Regional Coordination Center. I would like to express uh, my gratitude to Assistant uh, Secretary uh, Cooper for making room in his busy schedule uh, during uh, his visit in Bulgaria to be here with us. I'd like to thank the uh, US Embassy for the idea to organize this uh, virtual meeting. And I would like uh, to mention a few words about the background of uh, Mr. Cooper um, and the crucial point uh, um, uh, of uh, his um, biography for me is that he possesses over two decades of experience in both diplomatic and military roles. Uh, on the diplomatic front, Mr. Cooper served as U.S. alternative representative to the United Nations Security Council and was a delegate to the United Nations Administrative and Budgetary Committee. On the ground, uh, he acquired uh, invaluable foreign policy know-how while serving as advisor to uh, the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, in Iraq. Uh, speaking of uh, Mr. Cooper, armed force um, background, his active uh, duty military assignments are numerous and include um, tours with the Joint Special Operations Command, U.S. Africa Command, Special Operations Command, Africa, Joint Special Operations Tax Force, Trans-Sahara, and Special Operations Command Central. Uh, today, um, as I mentioned, uh, since the Secretary Cooper, who is in Bulgaria to reaffirm and strengthen the strategic security cooperation between uh, our two countries, um, uh, through the advancement of partnership in areas of uh, mutual uh, interest, will be sharing with us uh, his perspective on the state of the alliance between Bulgaria and the United States, both bilaterally and within the framework of NATO. Uh, the focal point uh, today on the discussion will be the strategic security and foreign policy significance of the Black Sea region, uh, which uh, likewise has long been a major, major area of the interest and research of the Bulgarian Diplomatic Institute having accumulated uh, extensive experience in the field, both in the framework of NATO and the EU common security and defense policy through numerous research projects, public lectures and training uh, programs. I would like to congratulate all of you participants here from uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, young and uh, um, experienced diplomats, our ambassadors from abroad, uh, representatives of the NGO sector and media, and to assure you that at the end of the um, uh, speech of uh, Mr. Assistant Secretary, there will be a long enough session to have uh, questions and uh, uh, answers. So 
um, not to, uh, to, to take more time. It is my pleasure, Assistant uh, Secretary, to give you this uh, virtual uh, floor. So you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Mihalova, uh, if I may, Tanya, and very much appreciate uh, the time uh, together with the Bulgarian Diplomatic Institute. Uh, I'm thrilled that we have a range of colleagues in this uh, discourse today who are new to diplomatic service as well as very seasoned, skilled uh, diplomats who were very much part of the investment uh, of the roadmap. Uh, and so, you know, part of the conversation today is uh, a little bit looking in the past, uh, what is past is prologue. The roadmap, that 10 year roadmap between the United States and Bulgaria is something that would not have occurred if uh, previous diplomats had not invested in the relationship in the NATO alliance, had not looked westward uh, in the early 1990s as the world was changing in 1989. So uh, very much uh, myself and, and colleagues uh, in my generation, uh, we are definitely working upon and standing on the foundations that were built uh, here in Sofia decades ago uh, and are now coming to be realized uh, today. Uh, those of you who are new or are entering diplomatic service, you will very much be a part of the implementation of this 10-year roadmap uh, and beyond uh, 2030. So what I would like to do uh, before we get into the, uh, the discourse format is to walk through uh, some of where we are today. Uh, and again, how, as to how we got there and where we're going. As we know, uh, the United States and Bulgaria enjoy a very strong bilateral relationship. Uh, and that cooperation has certainly played a significant role when we look at the transatlantic alliance uh, and our affiliation with the West. The October 6th signing, uh, as referenced uh, at the opening of the 10-year roadmap, this builds upon a very robust uh, security relationship that we established uh, primarily in 2006. Uh, and that initial defense cooperation agreement that was laid out, it's provided us the ability to be able to do uh, joint training, joint exercises. Uh, and this is something that we want to do further. This is a uh, part of the conversations that I've had in uh, ministerial fora uh, in my time in Bulgaria the past few days. And this roadmap is, is gonna serve as a guide and it, it already is serving as a guide for both of our states. Uh, we wanna make sure that we are strengthening each other's cooperation and that we do this uh, in, a, in a space of 10 years, again, looking beyond 2030. And there's, there's five critical areas that I would like to talk about today uh, in that investment space. Uh, one, uh, of certainly achieving uh, NATO modernization targets. Uh, this certainly uh, is at the heart of Bulgaria's sovereignty, but there's the mutual benefit of alliance readiness, uh, the mutual benefit of the ability to, to deploy uh, as allies and making sure that uh, we are truly interoperable uh, in, in, in that broader space. Making sure that also assisting defense institutions have a, uh, an accountable uh, and transparent uh, systems that can sustain that next generation. Uh, so when we talk about modernization, it's not just uh, equipment and material. Modernization is also processes. Modernization is also personnel. Uh, and then uh, as referenced at the beginning, uh, the, the Black Sea cooperation. We need to do that so that we can be sure that we deter uh, and counter any external threats uh, and challenges that may impact uh, or impede the effectiveness of maritime and air domains. Uh, this certainly not only has a security imperative, there's also an economic imperative as well uh, for Bulgaria as well as uh, NATO states. And then cooperating on cybersecurity. Uh, this is something that uh, we actually started upon uh, before uh, the 10 year roadmap. And this is to make sure that we deter any potential uh, malicious activities uh, that could attack uh, defense systems. Um, the cybersecurity space is also something uh, of interest in conversation with our two governments when we're looking at telecommunications as well uh, and the necessity for Bulgaria to be on the 5G clean path. Uh, this is so that uh, the interoperability, not just with the United States and Bulgaria, is assured uh, and secure, but it's also secure uh, with uh, our partners as well. And then of course, national resilience. 
when we talk about uh, security, it isn't just the integrity of borders. Uh, security, again, is not just uh, material. Uh, this is a combination of civil uh, preparedness as well as military capacity. Uh, this is so that Bulgaria can meet its North Atlantic Treaty uh, commitments. Um, and so when we're looking at how we're doing that, uh, this goes into an investment space. So from the United States perspective, uh, we want to make sure that, uh, that places where we are working together and potential locations where we may work further uh, are at a standard uh, that is uh, not only recognizable, but interoperable with other states. This is why we've previously invested uh, up to $50 million to upgrade joint facilities. Uh, and this is in the, uh, the frame of the European Deterrence Initiative. So this is not just bilateral, uh, this has a, a mutual benefit for a number of states. Uh, I'm, as I uh, may have been referenced, uh, I think it's already been in the news. I, I've taken great care uh, to visit uh, a number of bases in my time uh, in Bulgaria. Uh, this is looking forward again in that 10 year roadmap, but looking at where there may be uh, potential uh, presence uh, and training uh, and exercises that can be achieved bilaterally and of course in the Alliance frame. The United States has uh, invested in this space. Uh, Nova Cello, that training area is a particular location where we've put some investment. Uh, so uh, we can only not only host US forces, but be able to be participant uh, in some exercises. Atlantic Resolve is a perfect example uh, of a broader European context. And the US of course strongly supports Bulgaria's military modernization. Again, not limited to materiel. Uh, and that partnership has been further strengthened. Uh, if we go back to a year ago uh, in July of 19, um, and, and not too long after the Paris Air Show in, in June of that year of the purchase uh, and the attempt to purchase further of F-16s. This gets uh, Bulgaria into a space where such a major procurement uh, puts it further into the West, uh, affirms uh, our, our Western uh, frame uh, and affirms interoperability with NATO member states. We're very pleased that to make that further happen, uh, the United States was able to put forward a uh, near 60 million, a $56 million grant uh, to ensure uh, that that process went through. And we're already moving very uh, forward on uh, a number of the items in the roadmap. Uh, we were looking uh, just in fiscal year 2020. Uh, the Department of State, uh, we've allocated about $15 million in uh, FMF, and this is what we call foreign military financing. Uh, this actually helps uh, apply in development of capabilities. Uh, so this goes into the readiness frame. Uh, this goes into the modernization frame. And, and I would say Bulgaria is very competitive uh, in these grants. Uh, they're global grants, uh, but because of Bulgaria's leadership, uh, and those early credentials going back to the 1990s of joining the Alliance have put it in a, in a very special uh, place when we're looking uh, not only just at the Black Sea, uh, but the broader uh, frame of great power competition. And I mentioned earlier cybersecurity. Uh, this one uh, is one of, of significant growth uh, that uh, while from my uh, part of the portfolio is mostly uh, focused on security, aspects, uh, there are certainly derived benefits from an economic standpoint. Uh, the United States has a number of lessons learned uh, in this space, uh, and we certainly look to bolster the integrity of cybersecurity with, with our allies. In that frame, we put about $8 million uh, in funds, particularly focused uh, on cybersecurity. And this is to uh, have the Ministry of Defense uh, help establish a cyber defense center. Uh, in addition to this funding, uh, we have put a cyber advisor uh, in place at the, at the Ministry of Defense. Uh, this is uh, not only to help achieve these institutional reforms that are required for a cyber defense center, it's also to candidly uh, show or navigate uh, away from some of the challenges that uh, the United States has had to uh, experience firsthand. And then about another uh, $2 million uh, has gone toward uh, supporting secure uh, communications infrastructure. Uh, this would go toward Bulgaria's Joint Special Operations Command. Uh, this uh, ensures that the integrity uh, from the operational space uh, enables uh, better information sharing, uh, not only from a tactical perspective, but from an integrated operational perspective. And uh, 
then building that further, I mean, those are very tangible examples, but there's a much broader uh, holistic conversation uh, that is taking place uh, and was very much part of my conversations uh, here in Sofia. So then let's looking at the, the Black Sea, uh, the maritime domain awareness. Uh, this is one of uh, not only of the sovereign space and one of a mutual benefit between our states, it is one of a commitment uh, to the Alliance and one of particular regional context. Uh, as envisioned in the strategic partner framework, uh, we, and this was agreed to uh, by President Trump and, and Prime Minister uh, uh, Borisov, uh, this is it, only uh, a year ago, it seems like we had uh, agreed to that even further back. In fact, uh, an observation I've made in, in my meetings uh, here in Sofia, uh, I, I think uh, even Prime Minister Borisov would agree uh, that uh, both states have moved so much in an expeditious fashion uh, that uh, we have gone much further uh, than what would normally be realized from an agreement that was signed just uh, not even a full year ago. Uh, and that has led us in, into the space of the roadmap. Uh, and in particular, when we look solely at the, the Black Sea, uh, it is a recognition of the, the heightened, uh, not only awareness, but let's be honest, uh, the heightened security concerns uh, of interest in the Black Sea. Uh, there has been some provocative and aggressive behavior coming from Moscow uh, that has forced Sofia and has forced Washington uh, to play uh, closer attention uh, to that space. Uh, the actions uh, that uh, have caused uh, a certain uh, ire uh, in Washington, Sophia, uh, has uh, certainly uh, challenged uh, not only us, but it's also challenged uh, NATO. And what we want to make sure is that uh, that, that is not further challenged. Uh, Russia's militarization of the Black Sea, it creates uh, a number of threats. And their uh, primary threats, there are about three of them uh, that are of interest uh, to Bulgaria and to the United States uh, when we're looking at that. The first uh, is the is posed as Russia's advanced anti-access uh, and, and, and denial. So we, you know, A2AD, uh, again, anti-access and area of denial. Uh, that is one that's an issue. And those capabilities are something that uh, we need to address. Um, uh, and it also, I would say, you know, when we talk about that as a threat, remember, it's also a threat to freedom of navigation, not just from a naval capability, but freedom of navigation from a commercial capability as well. And then also the Black Sea is certainly is a potential of theater for Russian naval platforms. Not new, right? So if we go back uh, to the Warsaw Pact days, uh, that certainly was a consideration. And uh, Moscow hasn't changed its uh, posture or vision of that space since the Warsaw Pact time. Uh, this is where uh, there's the risk of uh, Russia potentially launching attacks against allies uh, and our interests. And then finally, you know, the, the third uh, piece of that uh, is Russia's expanded control of ports and sea lanes, uh, providing uh, Moscow potential uh, lever against smaller states, states that uh, may not have uh, the capacities that Bulgaria has. Uh, and would certainly threaten uh, larger consequences uh, for uh, not just Bulgaria, but uh, from an economic frame regionally. So looking at uh, where those risks are, uh, it, it's an imperative and incumbent uh, upon us uh, as bilateral allies, uh, and also looking at the responsibility as uh, alliance allies to uh, ensure freedom of navigation is not impeded uh, or disrupted uh, uh, by Russia. So to do that, uh, to deter uh, those provocative actions, to deter intent uh, that would be disruptive or an impediment uh, to freedom of navigation and economic interest, we wanna make sure that uh, our commitments from the United States are done to develop uh, and implement uh, maritime domain awareness uh, and also uh, develop maritime capacities uh, for Bulgaria promote interoperability amongst the states that have an interest uh, in the Black Sea uh, region. Uh, and that is something that of course is, is broader, uh, but of course we're looking here today state to state. There are a number of uh, allies who have, uh, are seeking to also increase their capabilities and their interoperability. Uh, and we appreciate Bulgaria's leadership 
uh, in working with those allies as well. This also gets into a place about uh, some of the infrastructure that's required to, to do that, uh, to further the information sharing, to further the interoperability. Um, in fiscal year 2020, uh, the Department of Defense, uh, working with the Department of State, uh, put in about, it was about 11 million uh, US dollars uh, to bolster the maritime domain awareness. And this, this goes into the, the capacities that I referenced earlier. Uh, this could be anything from uh, like actual uh, hardware upgrades, uh, software upgrades, uh, but essentially what this would do is this, this would put additional resources in the, uh, the Maritime Center in Varna. Uh, and, and it also would encourage uh, other states uh, to uh, put uh, some additional attention uh, to Varna. Um, and at this point, I'm happy to uh, open up the floor uh, for further discourse and discussion. Uh, happy to take questions. Um, there, there's, there's much more uh, that's been discussed, but, uh, but again, um, I, I would say on a personal note before we open up the floor, as someone who was a high school student in Moscow in 1988 and 1989, and I was forbidden to travel to Bulgaria, uh, to be here as a man uh, who has committed my uh, career and life to national security, uh, and building alliances with our close and dear partners. It is a thrill to be in Bulgaria. Uh, I'm happy to finally be here. It took a little longer than expected uh, and uh, am very much looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Assistant Secretary Cooper. Um, thank you very much for the nice words for Bulgaria. You are more than welcome to be here and to come again. And uh, I hope next time when you are here, we will have a chance to meet face to face with all of the audience here. Because still we think for diplomacy, it's very important to have this uh, personal exchange. But let's use the opportunities of the new technologies, though it's a good, good moment to have uh, uh, this um, um, uh, lecture now. So thank you very much for your insightful uh, uh, speech or uh, comprehensive speech. So I really don't want to waste time. And I know and I see raised hands from many people attending here. I just want to congratulate our colleagues from the uh, Rakowski National Defense Academy. Uh, I missed them uh, to congratulate them in the very beginning. So if you allow me uh, to proceed in this way, uh, I would like very much to, to give chance to all of the people uh, attending this meeting, but let me start with um, uh, someone who belongs both to the diplomatic service as former foreign minister, and now he's the president of the Atlantic Club, so founder of the Atlantic Club. So I'm really uh, tempted to give him uh, the, the floor first. And then I would like, uh, I see that there is another hand now uh, from a uh, young diplomat from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, so I keep the right to, to give them the floor because they are our trainees now and they have uh, the chance to, to ask uh, questions. And then if there are, I see there are some representatives of media who, if they would like to, to, to raise a question, please just give me a sign and then we proceed again with the media and NGO and uh, diplomats. So, um, Mr. Passi, you have this virtual floor. I would like to warmly welcome Secretary Cooper. Uh, this is really another step uh, upwards in the bilateral relation. Uh, and I would like to outline only three of uh, uh, many more possible uh, important uh, topics which exist between the United States and Bulgaria. And I would like to hear Secretary Cooper's uh, uh, comments on that. Uh, number one is uh, Russian propaganda in Bulgaria, which is, uh, uh, should be a priority number one, not only for Bulgaria, but for, for the entire Western ally, uh, alliance. Uh, secondly, in the uh, context of the post-COVID uh, rehabilitation of uh, Europe, we need uh, imagination. We need, so to say, uh, out, of, uh, out of the box ideas, which uh, do not necessarily always come from governments. That's why I would uh, ask uh, the secretary how he would uh, see uh, the options that uh, NGOs are, uh, are uh, heavily involved in the brainstorming of new ideas on how to get out of, uh, uh, of this new normalcy. And number three, to upgrade uh, uh, American-Bulgarian relations, 
I would suggest that uh, we continue not only thinking, but uh, start working on uh, cooperation between Bulgaria and the United States in space, both on uh, military and uh, uh, civilian tracks. In particular, on the civilian, uh, uh, the more so that uh, uh, NATO declared space as leg legitimate area of uh, actions of, uh, of, uh, of NATO. And on the civilian side, we would like to see a third Bulgarian astronaut, this time flying uh, either with uh, NASA or with Elon Musk. And uh, I will be very happy to see this, the visit of Secretary Cooper as a step uh, towards realization of uh, such an ambitious plan. Thank you. Dr. Pasek, good to see you again. Uh, uh, always a pleasure, regardless if it's in person or virtual, uh, as of course we all prefer in person. Uh, but since we have a, a virtual platform, I, I actually will, I'll start with the post COVID posture and ideas. So a good example is this far today, uh, auditoriums and theaters have a finite number of seats. Uh, this, this conversation today has a much broader platform I think one of the things that uh, NGOs, at least NGOs in the United States, have identified is the explosion in technological capabilities and reach to uh, in expand uh, transparency and expand accessibility to government. Um, yes, social media platforms uh, have, have certainly uh, provided that in recent years, uh, but the ability uh, for ministerial officials, uh, for CEOs of, of industry uh, to be able to be uh, more connected, further connected uh, beyond what would be natural constituencies and have a broader reach is actually a benefit. Um, uh, in some ways, uh, COVID, uh, oddly enough, has also helped identify some efficiencies. And we have, we have witnessed in the United States uh, different types of NGOs. Some in the security space that are looking at uh, protection uh, and readiness, which we'll, we'll touch a little bit later about uh, resiliency uh, to mis you know, disinformation campaigns. But the pandemic has also uh, provided an opportunity for us to collectively look at a better balancing of work and life. Uh, and uh, the, the new normal, as some call it, has also provided a, an, an opportunity for us to take a better look at uh, how we value time uh, in a, an office space or in a bureau. Uh, so it's been, uh, despite uh, the challenges, uh, you know, to, to use a phrase, there has been uh, a silver lining uh, in the pandemic. Uh, we have been able to find uh, opportunity in the adversity of the pandemic. And, and I encourage uh, everyone to do the same. Um, but yes, um, there, there are ideas in, I would say, in the communication space, in the workspace. Uh, also, there are uh, developing uh, economies uh, in that space. And so there's certainly been a challenge to some more traditional uh, interactions, uh, but there's also been uh, growth uh, we have found in some economic sectors. So um, I, I can assess at this early stage, post-pandemic, post-vaccine, uh, we are going to, as a society, uh, have some benefits that we're going to want to keep uh, after the pandemic. And this goes to uh, your point about uh, being resilient, right? So we built, we're, we've addressed collectively as a, as a global community, as a community of states, uh, resilience in the, in the health aspect and resilience in our economies uh, being impacted by uh, pandemic conditions. We do particularly the West, need to further develop our resilience to misinformation and disinformation coming from a number of locations. Moscow, of course, is the, the greatest uh, uh, challenge in that space. Uh, and uh, part of this isn't just coming back with information against information. It's being educated. It's being aware. It's having the ability to identify what is propaganda and identify what is just information. Um, it, is, it is a new space, uh, but some of the tactics are not new. Uh, and I think one of the benefits uh, that we do have uh, from history 
is we can recognize some of the tactics that were used in propaganda uh, during an early era. So uh, yes, uh, the platforms may do, be different, uh, but the intent to disrupt, the intent to divide, the intent to try to cleave away Western states from the West is not new. The tactics are not new. The intent is not new. Maybe the platforms are new. Uh, and this is why when we talk about cyber domain awareness, uh, there, there's a piece of that, but, uh, but there's definitely an incumbency on, on us to do some further work uh, to mitigate that uh, and be better uh, informed consumers uh, of information. And then finally, I, I'll close with the, the cooperation space. Uh, Bulgaria has a very strong, deep history uh, in space technology and space exploration. Uh, and there's certainly uh, room there. Uh, NASA uh, has, of course, uh, expanded over the years into uh, working with a number of states. Uh, and we're, we also are entering into space where commercial uh, applications are even increasing. Uh, and as you have seen, uh, the, the Trump administration has uh, worked very uh, quickly to build, a bond, build upon the foundations that were invested in uh, a space program uh, to actually develop a space force. And I think if I'm, if it wasn't today, the, the time difference may have me off. It's either Thursday or, or maybe tomorrow, uh, Secretary Pompeo uh, will be swearing in uh, new officers into the space force. So tremendous opportunities there. Thank you so much. Uh, now, uh, not wasting time. Uh, I uh, saw that there was a, a raised hand uh, from a colleague from the ministry, uh, Georgi Petrov. Georgi, are you ready? Uh, thank you, Mr. Cooper, for the interesting presentation and the insights you shared with us today. Um, I would like to highlight what the Defense Secretary, Dr. Mike Esper, said uh, during the signing of the 10-year roadmap. Uh, he estimated Bulgaria as a frontline NATO state and uh, plays a critical role in protecting NATO's eastern flank. So in this regard, and in your opinion, uh, which will be the main threat for the security and stability of the Black Sea region in 10 years, in more long-term perspective? Thank you. Thank you. So, Georgi is from uh, Department of... Uh, um, foreign Policy, uh, Planning, Information and Cooperation to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thank you. Thank you. So, Assistant Secretary, you have... Yeah. Well, Mr. Petrov, uh, yes. Uh, Secretary Esper, Dr. Esper, uh, certainly was uh, correct to highlight and emphasize the geography of Europe's uh, eastern flank, right? Um, but it's not limited to that. So today I did uh, talk about uh, what, what initial analysis uh, of the need to focus on uh, Black Sea uh, maritime domain awareness certainly is, is looking uh, to the east toward uh, Russia based on several things, right? Geography is a, a factor in that analysis. Uh, the behaviors and provocations coming from Moscow is a, a factor in that analysis. History, of course, factors in that analysis. But we should not stop there uh, because again, uh, I go to there's the, there's the commitments that the United States and Bulgaria have to the broader alliance. And then there are states that also uh, depend on the Black Sea for not just uh, border integrity or naval integrity and security. It is, there's a significant economic imperative there. So when we're looking at the Black Sea yesterday, today, and tomorrow, it will always be of an economic interest uh, to all those states on the Black Sea, as well as a security interest. But I would say as we look into the future and we look a little bit past the 10 years, because you mentioned 10 years uh, and also in the context of the framework is, well, Russia certainly factors and one looks at 
their locality and we look at the natural resources uh, in and around the Black Sea, uh, we also need to look at uh, port access, port integrity, and port management. And I, I would I would offer that while we're talking mostly today about domain awareness and freedom of navigation, we should not take our eye off of any potential risks from other uh, great power competitors when it comes to port access and port security and port management. What am I talking about? I'm also talking about Beijing. Uh, it is definitely part of the uh, PRC strategy to uh, insert uh, their presence in port management and port access. And so um, the, the, the main locus or focus on Black Sea Maritime Domain Awareness, yes, uh, is rooted uh, in the geography and the history and the natural resources and the access when uh, addressing Russia. But I, I, I would offer you, you're talking about, you know, looking a little bit further, we must keep our eye on, on intent uh, from Beijing as well. Thank you so much. Uh, so as I announced in the beginning, if uh, there is someone from the media who would like to raise a question, please uh, give us a sign. Uh, till then, uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Madame uh, Elena Poktodorova, our former ambassador to United States, and now she's uh, uh, at the Atlantic Club as well. And then, uh, um, if I may, to ask uh, Mr. Kuchukov, I don't, I think that you'd like to to to, uh, to raise a question as well. Am I right? Just give me a sign, Mr. Kuchukov. Okay, later. After that, then uh, Mr. Peter Krajci from uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Okay, um, Mrs. Poptodorova, you have the floor. Could you switch? Uh, yes. To... Unmuted, right. Um, uh, Mr. Assistant Secretary, uh, you may have not made it to Bulgaria some 30 years ago, but can you imagine what a message you would have been able to give us or not give us at all uh, that many years back? So today you're here with us. You're our uh, good messenger of good news, and that's a full compensation for the most time. So thank you for really giving us all these uh, 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 good uh, developments and, um, uh, and and basically good news. Uh, but you know what? Um, it's serendipitous because this is you're not the only one. You're not alone in this. Uh, m a lot more has been happening these last uh, few days, and I would like to invite you for a comment on um, other developments as well. Uh, just yesterday, Defense Secretary Esper um, um, publicly. Uh, mentioned and announced practically that uh, regarding the reallocation of uh, US troops from Germany, Bulgaria and Romania um, uh, considered uh, for this relocation. Um, it wouldn't be a surprise uh, to you if I tell you that uh, we at the Atlantic Club have been uh, making the case for this ever since uh, the decision of reallocation was made uh, months ago. Um, I would uh, argue that uh, if this uh, uh, reallocation happens, that would immediately bring to an upgrade of the combat skills of the uh, Bulgarian army. And this is not a propaganda, uh, uh, this is not a hollow, uh, sorry, uh, uh, hollow statement. Um, it is similar, and this I was thinking this morning, this is similar to, let's say, opting for an iPhone or wanting to have Google in the country. It is exactly this. I think we should divest our minds from uh, a prejudice that uh, we have different restrictions with regard to that kind of interaction in the, uh, in the general uh, security area in the military field. So that's my first um, uh, expectation. I'd like you to, to make a comment on this one. Uh, second thing, um, when... Uh, and that's the Three Cs initiative, my, my pet topic lately. Uh, when uh, it was announced back in 2016, for obvious reasons, of course, I immediately uh, got glued to it. And uh, the good news is that we at the Atlantic Club, we started uh, over a year ago, a National Three Cs initiative program. 
So we are not only following the developments, but we are very much engaged in that. Um, uh, but the good news from Tallinn uh, is that uh, um, it was the, the, this last summit was described as a consolidating summit, which is a great step forward, especially when we have Germany at the table, uh, we have the European institutions at the table, and of course the US. Uh, more importantly, uh, you generously decided to add another 300 uh, uh, million dollars to your previous investment. So basically you've risen your, your uh, basic uh, amount to 1.3 billion dollars. Um, the fund already approaches a total of uh, uh, one billion, which is uh, already a, a, a great beginning for next projects. I have two questions, or two I don't, they're not even questions, but reflections on this. Um, number one, which is probably closer to you. I would, I, I just let my mind race forward, apologies for that. But I would view the Three Seas Initiative and all the infrastructure projects there as a civilian support to the security arrangements in the region. It, um, civilian and infrastructure and digital, of course, support. Uh, so when, when we discuss security in the Black Sea and in the broader uh, Black Sea region, I think we should always remember that there is this uh, at the doorstep, the Three Seas Initiative, which will definitely uh, be a definite support. And I would really like your, uh, your comment on this. Uh, next thing, which um, is uh, a more of a practical nature, the fund, um, uh, which is managed from London, decided that they, or practically, maybe implied rather, that they will be um, coming up with specific projects in the coming days or even months by the end of the year. Uh, I would gently and cautiously uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, remind uh, um, that uh, it's very important what kind of projects will be selected first. They should uh, give uh, encouragement to everybody because of course it cannot be a project covering all 12 countries, but it should be a, a, a first very uh, meaningful decision which will prompt the countries of what the next steps would be. And if you have some secret to share with us as to how these first projects will be kind of uh, taken up, this will be mostly appreciated by everybody, I believe, in this audience. Thank you. Well, I'll start, I'll start with 3C's initiative. And uh, as you know, uh, Secretary Pompeo participated uh, in this fashion, in a virtual fashion. But what was not virtual, right? is the, the real focus and attention uh, on, on several things. Uh, one uh, that I mentioned earlier when we were talking specifically about uh, the Black Sea uh, is uh, freedom of navigation uh, in the sense of from a, a, not just a security sense, but from an economic sense so that that is not disrupted or impeded or, or any kind of a molestation uh, of, of commercial traffic. Uh, and, and then uh, the, the points about uh, civilian interest and support, uh, this goes back to uh, something we also talked about today, which is the integrity and security and management of ports, not just naval ports, but also commercial ports. Uh, there is uh, much uh, that can be done to uh, improve uh, that space uh, because if a commercial port uh, is uh, compromised or a commercial port is uh, no longer uh, managed uh, or protected per se uh, uh, by the host country. Uh, there is a risk uh, from a sense of exploitation uh, as also coercion uh, from uh, an external force. And so, you know, again, we've seen this uh, globally. Uh, so it's not a unique uh, consideration. We talk about the, the three C's of uh, addressing uh, ports, uh, not only being accessible, but also not being uh, at risk uh, of being compromised or putting uh, erosion of, of a host country's uh, sovereignty. So I, that, that, if, if that tips a little bit toward uh, project selection uh, and, and, and the, the calculus, uh, I would say that's, that's a part of it. Uh, certainly don't have uh, the crystal ball on that, uh, but, but I would say from what we have seen globally uh, and where there has been uh, intent uh, by Beijing to uh, coerce uh, and control 
uh, port access and port facilities. That certainly uh, factors into that space. Uh, and then uh, to uh, the the observation about uh, what Secretary Esper said about the the very unique, uh, significant, and strategic location of Bulgaria uh, when looking at Europe. Uh, so across uh, the entire uh, U.S. Uh, military uh, footprint, there's been a very uh, healthy discourse in Washington about the world and, and where uh, we may need to be or not be, uh, and where there may be uh, further opportunities for us to help uh, secure uh, and build uh, greater capacities of allies and partners and where there's opportunities for further mutual benefit. Uh, so it, it's really no surprise uh, based on the foundations built between the United States and Bulgaria going back to the early 1990s up to 2006, that first defensive cooperation agreement. And then fast forward uh, to that, that strategic launch uh, of toward the 10 year uh, framework uh, back with uh, Prime Minister Borisov and President Trump to the, the, the framework signature uh, this year, it really is no surprise uh, that there is a closer look at where there may be opportunity uh, to have a, a U.S. presence uh, in some fashion. Uh, Novo Selo uh, is, a, is a great case study of that from a, an exercise and rotational presence. Uh, and there's certainly room uh, for further interoperability with the United States and NATO states uh, and other basing. Uh, it is why I specifically uh, took the time and effort uh, to join uh, Bulgarian defense ministry officials uh, to uh, go to visit bases uh, while here. Uh, American farmers uh, have a, a belief that to appreciate uh, a terrain or a geography, they have to go smell the dirt. I've spent several days smelling the dirt in Bulgaria uh, to see where there is uh, current infrastructure uh, and where there's room for the United States to also uh, see opportunity as well potential uh, further investment uh, in infrastructure. And this, this is, uh, again, not limited uh, to uh, material uh, or significant platforms like the F-16. We're again looking in the space of, of, of readiness, of capability, and broader modernization uh, to ensure that the United States and Bulgaria uh, remain uh, in the forefront in our commitments to the NATO alliance. Thank you. So it's time to, to um, give the, the floor for question to one of our current uh, uh, trainee uh, young diplomat. Uh, um, Yavur, are you there? Yavur Rajiv? Yes, hello. Yes, please. You have the chance to, to ask the Assistant Secretary. Uh, thank you very much. I have a question for you. Uh, it is not very hard to see that uh, Turkey is becoming more and more problematic uh, ally. On the other hand, there is Russia, which is waging wide variety of operations, including hybrid ones against the countries of the Black Sea region, uh, not limited only to the best now example of Ukraine, but also against NATO members such as Romania and Bulgaria. Uh, so my question is, how does uh, the United States of America see the security configuration of the Black Sea region? And how does the United States plan to increase its capacity against non-military threats, which are as dangerous as the military threats? I heard about the cybersecurity, but the hybrid threats include uh, other aspects as well, such as gas dependency, state capture, and many, many more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and I'm glad you mentioned Turkey, because this is a, a shared responsibility uh, that the United States and Bulgaria have to keep Turkey in the West. Uh, they too have a role, uh, a responsible role in the, uh, the security uh, and the navigability of the Black Sea. Um, it is no surprise that uh, when we talk about Russians' uh, provocative behaviors, it's not limited to incursions in Ukraine, it's not limited to the Crimea, uh, we've seen where Russia has been disruptive uh, you know, further away, further afield in Syria. Uh, and, and frankly, Moscow would love nothing more than to see uh, Turkey 
uh, cleaved away, separated from the alliance, uh, and, and, and seeing that in a more disruptive space. It is challenging uh, because when we talk about provocations, Turkey is not uh, immune uh, or innocent uh, from uh, challenging uh, a number of not only allies, but partners in the, the European Union. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it is, it's incumbent upon us to be responsible to seek de-escalation uh, where uh, Turkey has, has uh, been a provocateur. Uh, and we have also been very, uh, very candid and clear with Ankara. I will, I will say that you know, in, in, an, in an open forum like this, um, the United States has been very clear uh, with Turkey as to what the expectations are for a member of the NATO alliance and what is not okay. Going back to Russia, uh, Russia, of course, uh, seeking to uh, be a provocateur to push uh, Turkey out of the West. Um, look, last year, uh, the procurement of the S-400 by Turkey or the intent to procure uh, was quite problematic. It remains a problem. It's not resolved. We're seeking to reconcile that. But it forced the United States to remove Turkey from the Joint Strike Fighter program, the uh, commonly known as the F-35 program. We had to do that. And yet, Turkey is still uh, pursuing to make the S-400 operational. That is a perfect, tangible example of where Russia is looking to not just poke at uh, Turkey's relationship with the United States, but that's where that's where Moscow is looking to disrupt the NATO alliance. So um, we still have to work to de-escalate uh, tensions, be it in the Eastern Mediterranean, be it in the Black Sea. Encourage Turkey to meet its commitments uh, in the alliance. Uh, do what we can uh, to block uh, further disruptions, but also hold uh, Ankara to account when necessary, which is what we have done. Uh, to your question about the, in the, in the hybrid space, uh, this does touch upon uh, a question and observation that, that Dr. Pasi made at the earlier of our, part of our discourse, which is going into how do we build and address uh, resiliency toward uh, propaganda, misinformation, disinformation, uh, that is something that, again, is shared uh, amongst uh, states in the West. Uh, it's not new. Uh, you know, for the United States, we uh, got a, a dose of that during the 2016 election cycle. We are now in another election uh, cycle in the United States, uh, 2020, uh, and we are already seeing evidence uh, of misinformation, disinformation uh, populating uh, our domestic uh, social media platforms, our uh, domestic uh, communications platforms. So from a, from a uh, hybrid standpoint, uh, that goes back to capacity uh, building, uh, not just again in a, in a conventional uh, kinetic space, it does go into the need for further uh, cyber capabilities. It does go into the need for us to have closer information sharing uh, so that we can be better alert but there, there's certainly space outside of my portfolio when we talk about education and edification of our citizens, of our, our neighbors, of our families as to uh, what they're being exposed to and, and casting a light, uh, putting a transparency in that space. Um, uh, and this, this is something that is a, a tremendous strength of Western states and is one that disinformation uh, can never compete against. The transparency of our governments, open society, rule of law, that wins. And so while we do need to build capacities and we do need to expand edification, the transparency and accountability in our systems and our government in the sunshine and our open societies, that wins. The West is winning, but we still have work to do. And I'm very happy to see that we have a new class of diplomats in this conversation today, because as we talk about a 10-year roadmap between our two states, 2030 is gonna be here very quickly. Um, and much will be required of you. And many of you who are in training today will be 
implementing the elements of this roadmap. And I think I have uh, time for one more question. One more question. Yeah. Thank you so much. We have two more questions, but uh, so if you allow me to invite those who have these two questions, if they formulated them very as a short, uh, uh, so let's say maybe message and um, allow me to, 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 to have two questions. So I invite uh, Mr. Lubomir Kuchukov, who is director of the Institute of Economy and International Relations, please be very short. And then we have uh, the director of uh, Department of America and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Peter Krajcev, please be very short and to have uh, short answers if possible in order to, to keep the time for um, uh, Assistant Secretary. Please, Mr. Kuchukov. Uh, thank you. Really a very short question. Uh, obviously, Russia is uh, the elephant in the room, or I'd rather say the elephant in the sea. Uh, NATO, NATO's approach towards Russia is uh, double-breasted, uh, deterrence and dialogue. So being biased, I would ask about the dialogue. What are the possibilities for future dialogue with Russia for de-escalation, as you just mentioned about such a possibility, in, uh, in the Black Sea? and uh, bilaterally, having in mind also the new START negotiations, and also taking into consideration that recently you had a rather unique uh, fact of a joint declaration of the three uh, Nagorno-Karabakh co-chairs of the Minsk group, Russia, uh, the United States, and France. Does that offer uh, a possibility to continue a dialogue? Yes, I, I would say bilaterally, of course, uh, where there has been challenges uh, between uh, Washington and Moscow, it has never precluded a dialogue uh, at the different levels, at the head of government all the way down to the working. Uh, it is why uh, we continue to seek uh, a dialogue and actual uh, progress on a new START treaty that has certainly uh, been uh, in discussions. Uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Ambassador Marshall Billingsley, our special envoy, has been working um, mightily to actually uh, keep that uh, in, a, in a warm space. Uh, and you mentioned the Minsk Group. Um, and, you know, this is, this is a, an opportunity. Uh, I, I know that uh, Ambassador Gilmore, uh, our ambassador to the Organization of Security Cooperation in Europe, uh, he, along with Secretary Pompeo, are certainly uh, encouraging uh, parties uh, to sit down very soon, actually, regarding uh, you know both sides with Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, for for reconciliation. So the you know the Minsk group is definitely a, a channel uh, bilaterally with Moscow. New Start is one, um, but but I'll also offer there are others. Um, you know there, there's some that don't always get um, uh, the attention maybe they deserve. Uh, you know there's been uh, historic. There's been work uh, when we're talking about disruption of uh, facilitators and uh, disruption of the illicit trafficking that can contribute to terrorism. That is one area where we've been able to uh, work with Russia and, and be, be successful. And then also I would offer there's, there's an ongoing uh, continuing conversation uh, that we have uh, you know, in that space that uh, not only connects uh, disrupting uh, terrorists and terrorist entities, but again, uh, those that may be uh, facilitators uh, that are not ideologically uh, tied. So yes, the, the, there, there's always a, a dialogue. Of course, in that space, we encourage uh, Russia uh, not uh, to disrupt uh, and not to be uh, fan the flames of provocation. Um, and also to remind Russia that they should not be threatened by NATO. If anything, uh, we are, are often as NATO states uh, looking to make sure that uh, we are not at risk of threat uh, by Russia. Thank you so much. The last question. So, uh, Mr. Krychev, the director of the American Department at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, you have the last question. Um, so, you have the floor. Madam Director, thank you very much. Uh, Assistant Secretary Cooper, I would simply like to welcome you to Bulgaria on behalf of the America's Directorate. Uh, I wouldn't be true to myself if I didn't express my appreciation to our exceptional colleagues at the U.S. Embassy in Sofia uh, for helping us facilitate your visit on our, on our side so smoothly. Uh, 
Assistant Secretary, I have to say that uh, your visit falls within the strategic dialogue between Bulgaria and the US, but uh, I can't help but notice that uh, this is not just a matter of professional affiliation. Uh, it kind of creates and builds uh, a sense of community. Uh, and I can actually prove it because those are decades of work and multiple lifetimes of so many people uh, working on the further development of the relations, the strategic partnership between Bulgaria and the US. I'll give you just a simple example. 20 years ago, some 20 years ago, when I joined the Foreign Service, uh, I was working under Dr. Passi, who is taking part in this very event right now. I served in Washington twice under Ambassador Pop Todorov. So there's so many people involved, so much dedication, and uh, so many things that we share. Uh, in line of that, I would like to thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for paying a visit uh, to Bulgaria. Uh, and in conclusion, I have to refer to another passion of yours. You used to be Assistant Director of the National Park Service, and you, sir, are an Eagle Scout as well. Which is why I know you're leaving Bulgaria today. I wanted to bid you farewell with something that as a fellow nature enthusiast, I made myself uh, in solitude during one of my bushcraft experiences. So thank you very much, farewell, and stay safe. This is what I did. And I brought it specifically to say goodbye to you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. How very apropos for you to be director of, of the Americas because of the, the, the wide, vast uh, lands. Uh, and you are definitely uh, ready for the mountains, uh, you see. Um, no, I, I very much appreciate your observation about the, the work, uh, the foundations that been, have been laid. And we've all recognized that today. Uh, and, and that's why it's important that we have uh, new colleagues uh, entering into uh, diplomatic service and new colleagues who are entering uh, defense uh, military service. Uh, when we look at uh, the global uh, enterprise of security, uh, we've talked a lot today about interoperability of our states and the interoperability of the NATO alliance. I would, I would like to offer, especially to those who are currently in training, uh, who will be entering service uh, and dedicating their uh, careers to national services, that it is very critical that there's interoperability uh, at the ministerial level, that there's, there's interministerial, interagency uh, communication and cooperation. Uh, it is a challenge, I'll, I'll be honest with you. It's not, uh, it's not unique in any capital to have healthy uh, debate, healthy discourse and difference of opinion, um, but uh, it's important uh, for uh, success in that space for ministries to communicate, for services to communicate. Uh, and so I'm thrilled that there's been a uh, uh, interagency flavor uh, in the discussion today. Uh, and uh, looking across the generations uh, that have been participant in our discourse today, I would like to leave with just one thing. Uh, we are moving onward and we are moving upward. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Assistant Secretary Cooper. It was a pleasure for us to have you today in this virtual discussion. I would like to thank very much for your time first and then to the US Embassy and to Ambassador uh, Hero Mustafa and for the good cooperation with the Embassy uh, with the Diplomatic Institute. And I would like just to mention as I have this um, practice at the end of the events at this time it is virtual just to thank uh, to some people who were so kind to organize all of this uh, uh, session today. This is uh, Peter van der Waal from the uh, embassy and my dear colleague from the Institute, Silvana, Stefan and Niki. And so all of the people that have uh, uh, helped us in organizing uh, this event. Thank you once again. I hope that this meeting and discussion was useful for uh, all of the people attending today. So all of us uh, to, to, to keep something from today. Thank you so much. Uh, enjoy your visit still in Bulgaria. Thank you very much to our audience today, our friends and people from the circle that we are uh, very happy to, to have around us at the Diplomatic Institute. Thank you once again. Enjoy the visit. <laughs>